And I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to Joe. Hello. Um, and I'll say too, while I, um, I'm going to leave my video on, but I might, my Wi-Fi tends to go out a little bit. So if it freezes or the audio gets funky, let me know and I can turn it off and it might help um, with that. Um, so yeah, thank y'all for coming. Um, I am going to use uh, the same slides that I used for the Circidenix presentation that Jenny mentioned, but I edited them a little bit because that one is more aimed at public libraries. Um, and we're focusing on UNCG today. Um, so I have this slide, which some of y'all probably don't need this slide. So just a little bit about me. I'm the GIS and Data Viz librarian. I am um, the library liaison to the informatics and analytics program and the GES department. Um, and I say those two because um, I help them a lot with GIS and data viz. So this um, topic of data viz and empathy and ethics and what data sets you can use ethically come up for me a lot. Um, I also wanted to mention the Visualizing the Future Symposia, which I'm a fellow of. So this um, Visualizing the Future Symposia is a grant project um, that looks at uh, data visualization pedagogy and the instruction of data visualization. So um, it's an IMLS funded national forum grant and they're looking to move data visualization, uh, which is traditionally or, or typically taught in a very hands-on tutorial or tool centered way. Um, so, you know, you go to a workshop and they tell you specifically how to make a chart in Excel or a chart in Google Sheets or Tableau. Um, so they're trying to move that type of instruction to a more critically engaged, um, in a more critically engaging way, um, so really engaging with your data visualizations, um, thinking about how, uh, what message you're presenting with your data visualizations and your data, um, and treating it more like a information literacy kind of, so more like data literacy and data visualization literacy. So how do you understand it? How do you evaluate it and create good data visualizations? Um, because they can be very misleading and do the opposite of what you intend to do, um, which y'all might have seen in social media and news, especially with COVID-19. Um, there's a lot of misleading data visualizations out there. Um, so previously I worked at the UCPA and I was a biology undergraduate. So I've worked with data visualizations a lot in the context of the sciences um, and in the labs and sciences where I use data viz as a creator of data visualization or a reader of data viz, um, I did a lot of it to share messages about my research, you know, so here's what I did this week at lab meetings, for example, um, or to kind of give in presentations, um, both for my, my lab groups and also for the broader EPA organization or for um, to share my research with other people in a way that is quickly digested versus like a 10 page paper. Um, so those are two ways that I've used it in the past in science. So I'm going to look at data visualization, not in the sciences, uh, but at the library um, and specifically academic libraries. Um, this will be applicable to public libraries and other like special collections of uh, archives, university archives as well. But I am going to try and focus on academic libraries a little bit, but it's applicable for a lot of different things. Um, so let me see real quick. Yeah, so I want to look at how data this can be used in the library. Um, empathy's role, so how empathy can be used to strengthen your visualizations and your library community connections, um, or <clears throat> can be used to mislead um, and misrepresent data. Um, I also want to take a look at ethical data visualization, so what ethical considerations need to be made um, when you're creating and using data viz and data in general in the library. Um, and ultimately, I want y'all um, to leave feeling hopeful or positive about data visualization um, and maybe with um, some questions to ask yourselves in order to make good data visualizations or to improve it, to implement or improve it um, in your projects and research and when you're sharing um, uh, outreach or research results. So I'm going to get started with data viz at the library. So I'm starting with the data driven library. Um, it's not a super new concept and UNC Greensboro, I would consider to be a data driven library and I think we are a data driven library. Um, so what does this mean? Um, it means you take data or information about the library and its users and what services we offer and use it to inform policy and services or programming. Um, so we collect metrics and statistics on things like computer and space usage, database and website access, um, 
like circulation statistics, reference interactions. Um, so you know how many people asked where's the bathroom in a given week um, and other reference interactions. Um, looks at things like financial health and staffing, um, which we don't see a lot or use internally at the library unless you're at like the administration level, but which other uh, data institutions have access to that information. Um, and things like community demographics. Um, so to meet your needs, so why, why do we collect this data? So to, to meet needs of your community, um, so our students and our faculty and researchers and our UNCG community, um, you have to know what they need, um, which is why you would gather this data. So what are they using? What do they need? Um, which you can then use to request and justify funding. Um, you can use it to identify needs for collection development or for weeding, um, which I do a lot for older GIS texts that are from like pre 2000s um, because the computers are physically different uh, now. And then you can use it to plan programming and services, um, especially since we have limited time, we have limited resources and staffing available. We have to narrow down what we can offer. Um, so uh, some sources of library data, and these are mostly focusing on quantitative data, so like numerical um, data. There are some that are more qualitative or like experience data um, as well mm. from things like uh, uh, interviews or oral history type things. Um, and they can be used together, um, but a lot of data visualization visualizes that numerical data, um, but they're best used together, which I'll get into in the later half. Um, so some sources of library data include that internally collected data, um, like what we collect. So through forms, assessment, invited feedback, maybe you're collecting data versus a circulation software tool. Um, and those are going to be specific to the library that's collecting that data. Um, there are also uh, surveys, library surveys. So the my favorite one to look at is the Academic Library Survey. Um, from the National Center for Education Statistics, and that is a survey, I believe it's annual now. Um, yes, it's annual and it's mandatory um, for academic, all post-secondary institutions in the United States. Um, if you participate in federal student aid programs, you have to submit data to this survey. Um, so we have, uh, uh, we contribute data to this survey and we have information in this data set. Um, so I believe, yep, it's annual and we can access this data through like Data Planet is one of the databases that we um, can use to access this information. And it collects um, information about personnel, staffing, um, how much money we spend on certain programs or on, uh, so for example, they have one that's a um, uh, number of eBooks in the collection, I think is one of the fields that they collect. Um, so that's one of the surveys. There's also um, surveys like the IMLS Public Library Survey and the Public Library Association's Public Library Data Service Survey, um, which are very similar. So the IMLS survey um, is a census of approximately 9,000 public library systems. Um, and I think it's been collected since 1988 and you can access it using Policy Map, which we have a subscription to as well. And then the Public Library Data Service um, is conducted on behalf of the Public Library Association. And instead of just the United States, the Public Library Association one also includes data on uh, Canadian libraries and institutions. So um, let me see here. So the Public Library Association data set um, was not collected for this past year. Um, and one of the reasons they decided to do that was because it did overlap a lot with this Institute of Museum and Library Services the data that they collect for that. So they decided to get a committee together to reach out to folks that use that data set and see, you know, how can we improve this data? How can we make it better? How can we make it fit your needs more so that you can plan and use it um, for planning programming and things like that? Um, so the feedback included less redundancy in data collection. So diversify what data you're collecting since we already get that from IMLS. And also we want improved data training and community indicators. So they wanted a more of an idea about their community and this data set was not fulfilling that role. So the Public Library Association responded to that by putting out community engagement resources. So how do you connect with your community? How do you engage them in your programming and include them in your programming? Um, and you can also find community indicators. Um, so things like, uh, 
I guess, just straight up demographics. So who is making up your community? How much do they make? Um, what race or ethnicity are they? Uh, how far do they have to drive to get to the library? Um, or is there public transportation that they use to get to the library, for example? Um, questions like that. You can also get through demographic data. So the US Decennial Census, which is every 10 years, and we just did one, hopefully you've filled yours out. Um, and then the annual American Community Survey, um, which is also, uh, which is not every 10 years, is annual every year. And it's a little bit more detailed. Um, this is all public, uh, publicly available free data. So you can go to the census website and access that data um, to get a better idea of what the demographics of the community in your specific, so for example, county, so in Greensboro or Guilford County. Um, and you can also use databases like Policy Map, Social Explorer, and the more recently acquired Data Planet, which we just got um, to explore around your, um, around the area better. All right. So why data visualization? What role does this have in that, that community engagement when you want to get a feel for your community and what you're offering them? So data visualizations help us to see patterns, make comparisons, examine relationships, and summarize complicated data. Um, it takes the form of a lot of different types of charts and visualizations. So um, you've got your standard uh, bar charts, you've got line graphs, you've got uh, pie charts, which would do like percentages of a whole. Um, there's also some more fancy ones. So like this timeline, we have the timeline of, uh, I think it's called, but slavery was so long ago and it's a design um, by Surflin. So it shows that uh, there's a long period of American slavery and segregation before we reach current times. So it can kind of put um, issues in perspective uh, uh, visually. Whereas if you're just looking at these numbers, it's kind of hard to really get a feel for how big those are. Um, there's also word clouds, um, which visualize frequency that a, a word appears in a body of text or a corpus. So in this example, um, the word big and data, so big data appear the most. Um, the problem with word clouds is you can't tell how much more big data appeared than the other words in this body of text. You just know that it appeared more. Um, so if you are looking for just a general comparison, it's good for that. And then there's also things like maps. Um, so this is a, an example visualization showing the 2016 election um, I, uh, published by Time. So it shows, I want to say electoral votes um, as these little bubbles. So here's how many people in this county voted Democrat or Republican or um, different parties. So you can show a lot of different things with maps. Um, that's just one example. So data visualization overall, um, according to Tableau's Data Visualization Beginner's Guide, um, is another form of visual art that grabs your interest and keeps our eyes on the message. When we see a chart, we quickly see trends and outliers. If we can see something, we internalize it quickly. It's storytelling with a purpose. Um, so I have two notes with this quote. Um, the first is that Tableau is very heavy-handed with their visual art metaphor. Um, so they love to say, you know, visual art, you keep your eyes on it, you can see things. Um, but there are a lot of different ways to represent data that aren't just visual. You can also, um, for example, use 3D printing to print out a bar chart so that you can feel it um, and you can feel the different uh, sizes of each category, for example. Um, so I've seen charts where you can print it out using a special raised format printer alongside Braille so that folks who are visually impaired or blind can still, you know, quote, quote, see, they can still experience that visualization quickly. Um, so it's not just visual. And you can also use sound. I've seen things where they go up the scale of notes, of musical notes, as the data gets higher in magnitude, um, which is super cool. So there's a lot more that you can do with it. Uh, my second point about Tableau's definition here or their, their statement um, is that they say data visualization is storytelling with a purpose, which kind of implies that storytelling doesn't have a purpose. Um, that's my own personal opinion. Storytelling could have a purpose. Um, Tableau's point here is that data visualization tells a story about your data or your information. Um, so it helps if you know your purpose before you make one. Um, 
it's a, very important to note what purpose you're trying to make when you're creating visualizations or when you're reading visualizations to think about what purpose that creator had um, because data visualizations often evoke emotional responses. Um, data viz and the data that they represent are often thought of as you know hard, cold science, cold data. Um, people think of them as facts. When you see a chart on Facebook, maybe before COVID-19 started, you were more likely to see it and think, oh yeah, that's exactly what's happening. Um, but it's not. So data visualizations and data carry with them the biases of their creators. Um, so it's important to critically engage with them as you see them and as you're creating them to make sure they're accurately representing the data and the people that the data represents. Um, so it's very important to remember that each data point or each data set represents a person if it's about a community. So data visualizations can have many purposes. You can use them to summarize or simplify findings. You can use them to report on a target or a goal. Um, you can investigate findings to see where your piece fits in the puzzle. Um, so this kind of goes on with summarizing or simplifying findings, but then you're extrapolating it outward to see where does it fit with other people's research or other people's projects. Um, and you can also use it to start a conversation, which is where we see it a lot on social media. Um, with COVID-19 too, you're starting a conversation about why are we wearing masks? You know, Why are we socially distancing? What's the research? being done and what does it say um, as far as, you know, how do we stay healthy and um, help protect our community? So where does empathy come in? Um, I have an example visualization here. I'll take a quick break. I talk a little bit fast, so feel free to put in the chat that I need to slow down if I need to. So in this example, um, Solar eclipse searches are in blue or the uh, top line here. And my eyes hurt is the other line or this one. So this is a, um, a Google trend, I guess, line graph, line chart um, that shows the number of times a term or a phrase was searched on Google um, and they use specifically in New York. So how popular was this search term at a certain point in time? So I believe this is for one of the days uh, that there was a solar eclipse in 2017 um, so this many people searched solar eclipse and then like an hour later, the number of times people searched my eyes are spiked. Um, this is a kind of a humorous one that I have in my office, just like as a joke in case people see it. Um, because it's kind of funny, like, ah, uh, people didn't know you can't look at the solar eclipse without glasses. Um, but if you don't have that context and that background, maybe it's not as funny, or if you're coming at it differently, if you're thinking, oh, you know, like that sucks all these people damaged their eyes looking at a solar eclipse, um, it might not be as humorous when you're looking at it. Um, so the purpose of data is, is to summarize and simplify data in an efficient way. So you want them to be um, not necessarily minimalist, but the, the current trend with data visualizations is to have the least amount of noise as possible so that you can read it very quickly and move on with your day. Um, but you still need a certain amount of context. So if we didn't have this title here, if we didn't have these this legend, um, the source being Google Trends, this would have no meaning whatsoever. So there still has to be some information on here and enough information that so that the community you're aiming your visualizations at that you're trying to connect with can understand what's going on. Um, so having the context that your audience is familiar with is important. Um, another one is experience. So here's an example chart from right when COVID-19 was first uh, beginning, kind of in March, uh, March 11th, I think is when this was tweeted. So um, there was a visualization going around in Vox that was just the boring pink and then gray showing the um, the flattening the curve effort to uh, prevent cases like ICU hospitalizations for COVID-19 from overwhelming hospitals. Um, so beforehand, it was kind of, you know, maybe boring even. People saw it and then kind of moved on. So this person redrew uh, catening the curve and rephrased it to be an alert kitty outbreak. So if you have a lot of cases all at once, it'll uh, shred the healthcare system like the arm of your couch or you could have a lazy kitty outbreak. So it's the longer intervals between infections. So the amount of time that this cat, this lazy cat will hold its position. Um, there is 
pros and cons to this type of visualization, to this specific visualization. Um, it adds a little layer of humor to it. It makes it a little bit more engaging if you can connect to it, you know, making it kind of a joke. And there's also the con is that it kind of makes it a joke. So this is a, a serious issue. Um, depending on what audience sees this graphic, it might be considered tone deaf. Um, and it will affect who can, af who can connect to this uh, graphic and who will actually get a good message out of it. Um, so that's one of those things where it's kind of like a read the room. Um, are you exploiting or, you know, referencing a serious situation that is important for a community in a way that's disrespectful or um, harmful? Um, or is it, you know, poking fun and is it, is it a proper use of humor? Um, and a lot of that determines on, you know, are you a part of the community that you're trying to reach out and engage with your data visualizations? So um, thinking about what the community that you're trying to engage cares about. So if you're um, uh, just looking at data, it's really hard to get that. Um, so this is where those experiential knowledge, where the qualitative data, those interviews, knowing your community comes into play so that you can combine that with your quantitative numerical data to really make a great data visualization. Another thing to consider um, when you're leveraging empathy to really connect with an audience's design. Um, so you want to make sure it's accessible. You want to make sure that the people you want to read it can read it. Um, so if you have an audience, so say you're um, trying to do programming for older audiences, um, so specifically like folks, I guess, 70 and up, 80 and up. Um, if you're designing for um, an audience that has low vision, they're deaf or hard of hearing, maybe they have physical or motor disabilities, um, there are certain ways to design your visualizations and your websites that are accessible so that they can engage with that content. And here are a couple of example flyers, um, which I like to use from, I want to say, they're published by the Home Office of the UK United Kingdom government, but um, I think they're just general, designed by Carl Weipun. Um, yeah, and then uh, fourth, after accessibility, is still kind of a design concept, is just straight up design. So are you using space and scale um, to point out differences in your data? So scale meaning, for example, this trash heap right here is takes more time to degrade. So the comic artist made it bigger than the person um, who takes only 80 to 100 years to degrade, which is kind of a crude way to put that. Um, you can also use color. So especially when you have people who are red, blue or red, green colorblind, um, are you using red and green to denote good and bad or bad and good? Um, folks won't be able to tell the difference between red and green if they're colorblind. And so your visualization is basically useless if you're um, reaching out to a community and audience who has individuals um, like that in there. Um, color is also a cultural phenomenon. So in the US, our stops, uh, traffic, traffic signals, there we go, are red, yellow, and green. Um, in other countries, they might be like a different shade of green or blue, or they might have different colors. So we come into it with different uh, ideas. Um, so keep that in mind when you're choosing colors for your visualizations as well. Um, there's also iconography. So you can use um, icons to help reach out to certain communities or connect to certain communities. Um, there's a thing called anthropographics, um, which this is an example of that. So they included a small figure of a person in their comic, in their, their data, um, data visualization comic. Um, and this is that data comic mentioned here. Um, so it's a comic that represents data or includes a data visualization in a way that engages engages an audience to get them to you know care about an issue to have a call to action to you know maybe donate you know recycle in the case of this one don't just throw out trash um, and plastic um, so they used a human figure to help the audience place themselves into that visualization um, so if you are in a uh whew, i need more coffee today <laughs> um, if you're in a predominantly let's say black neighborhood and you're trying to run programming that's specifically 
about like something that matters to that community. Um, you don't want your poster to just have all white people. It doesn't represent that community. It's not um, representative of the audience that you're trying to reach, of the community that you're trying to engage. Um, so be cognizant of who you're including in your data visualizations if you're using those anthropographics and those uh, human figures. Um, so if you have uh, noticed, I believe, it's been a while since I've been in the library, but there's the signs above the ref desk um, have a lot more diverse people on them now to better represent our students. Um, there's also kind of a fine line with that, though, where you want to avoid the tokenism. Um, so if you're including a wide range of people in your data visualizations, beware of, you know, just putting in one uh, person of color. Uh, if you're trying to reach out to a broader community, it it shouldn't be an afterthought to include that one person. Um, so keep that all in mind if you're designing data visualizations. Um, so the datacomics.net project was included um, as part of that visualizing the future project that I mentioned earlier. So Sally Gore and Tess Greinick um, are two of my colleagues in that group that are looking at data comics and um, how you can use a story in a comic, but also combine it with that data visualization where you've got different, um, so like bar charts, but make it a comic um, to help connect with that audience better. Um, and they're finding that there's a lot of different ways to do that using design elements. Um, so if you write down that link, I highly recommend checking that out. Um, and that's where I found this comic once more again. So a quick summary. Um, you can connect with a community using empathy um, through these three and more concepts. So you can use context, experience, and design to connect with your community um, better and to engage them in your programming and in your data visualizations. Um, note that this isn't an exhaustive list. So these are just things that I've come across um, and that uh, the Visualizing the Future group has come across in our research and as we've seen data visualizations, but there's tons more way to, uh, ways to incorporate empathy into data visualization. Um, and this is not limited to these three. So in addition to be able to connect with an audience better, design choices can also be used to mislead or misrepresent data. Um, and it's important to note that this isn't always intentional. Um, so real quick, uh, I'm trying to see, I can't really see the chat very well, but what do y'all think of when you see this? Like what's your first gut reaction? What does this chart say? And I can read responses out as they're coming in so you don't have to worry about looking. Thank you, cool. And just quick at a glance, like without really looking at it, what, what does this look like it says? It looks like blood dripping down, says Susan. Yep, blood. So, oh yeah, so like visually impactful, maybe like, oh God, blood. For me, it looked like um, I was looking at the, the white space. Um, Brown says it implies that stand your ground caused a downturn in gun deaths. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, it looks like stand your ground gun death plummeted. Yeah, so I think there were two people that said the same thing that Brown said. Yeah, it, it makes it look like at first glance, gun deaths in Florida, or the number of murders committed using firearms plummeted after the 2005 stand your ground law was enacted. Um, but if you look at the y axis, if you take a couple more seconds and really look at this chart and see what it means, um, it starts at zero up at the top instead of at the bottom like what we would expect. Um, so if you've seen line charts or line graphs before, you know the axis usually starts with the zero on the bottom. So that's what you're looking for. Um, so it's very misleading. It actually says that number of murders committed using firearms skyrocketed after that 2005 stand your ground law. Um, and it's also important to note that correlation and causation aren't necessarily the same. So just because they skyrocketed after this was enacted doesn't mean it was as a result of it. Um, but it suggests a pattern that should be looked into. So this um, is also a little bit misleading because of how data visualizations are sourced. So there's no standard in sourcing your data visualizations yet, like with other graphics or images or when you're citing data or uh, things like books and journals. So commonly they'll say source, floor, uh, and then they'll have the source. So this refers to the data source. 
if you're unfamiliar with how data visualizations are sourced, you might think the Florida Department of Law Enforcement published this visualization, but they did not. They only published the data. Um, Christine Chan in 2014, Christine Chan um, ac actually is the person who designed and published this graphic for Reuters for a Reuters article, which has since been taken down because this is one of the most notorious bad visualizations in the field. Um, so she created this um, and she was inspired by another visualization showing, I believe, violence or gun deaths in Iran. Um, so she was inspired by the eye catching red, like showing that it's um, uh, like implying a negative um, and connecting to the audience using that red uh, to us culturally bad, you know, it's blood, it's, it's denotes violence. Um, so she was trying to connect with her audience that way. And in making that design choice chose to flip her axis. Um, unfortunately, it changed the message of the visualization. If you're just scrolling through Facebook and you see this quickly, you think, oh, okay. And then you move on instead of really engaging with it. Um, so this was not an intentionally misleading graphic, but it ends up being extremely misleading. Um, so the evoking of emotion can carry risk. Be careful and intentional in your design choices, um, or else you might end up as this unfortunate visualization creator is, you know, her visualization has basically been scrubbed from Reuters website and it's been shared on so many websites as like one of the worst examples of visualizations, um, but it was unintentional. And this is where ethics can come in as well. So in addition to the, uh, risk associated with, you know, that can come in when you're evoking emotions, um, especially negative emotions or, uh, you know, things like gun death. It's, it's a, I'm drawing a blank on words, but, um, it's very tragic to think about, and it's a very strong emotion for a lot of people. Um, so it, it's important to keep that in mind with the message that you're trying to show. And this might not come as uh, up as much for when you're doing like library data visualizations, right? We're probably just showing information about how many books we have, how many ebooks have circulated per year, how many people have used our space. Um, but it's important to keep these in mind since our data also represents people. Um, and it's a good thing to keep in mind just in general too, um, when you're working with data. So some other things to keep in mind are uh, uh, exploitation versus benefit. So um, one of ALA's core values of librarianship is social responsibility. Our services are intended to be beneficial to the community or the audience. Um, so our design choices, especially when we're using data viz as advertisements for programming, um, can be used to benefit or exploit groups. And you see this a lot with advertising in general. Um, and it's not just limited to library outreach. So in this example tweet that always makes me giggle when I see it, California guy now, who is at Internet Hippo on Twitter, says, I like how ads have gone from buy a Toyota. So this is a difficult and uncertain time for us all. Buy a Toyota. Um, and this has only gotten worse and worse as COVID-19 pandemic has kept going. So there's so many commercials out there that say, you know, in these trying times, our product will be there for you and your family. Um, and it's all very exploitative of a situation to sell a product. Um, although we think of ourselves as library um, uh, uh, personnel, as library folks, we have to be aware of the public opinion of libraries and of our services and our, our outreach. Um, we like to think of ourselves as different from businesses. You know, we are, um, providing a public service, public good, but the audience that see our data visualizations and our outreach might think of us differently. Um, to them, you know, are we the institution to them? Um, do they see our ads and think, oh, they're just trying to sell me something, um, even if it's a free webinar or something like that. Um, so be careful and cognizant of, you know, don't exploit situations. Um, if you're trying to reach out to a community about a, a situation, there's, um, certain design choices that are more respectful than others uh, that you can use. Okay. Um, the second one, so another um, ALA core value of librarianship is privacy and confidentiality. So when we're collecting, storing, and sharing and publishing community data specifically, 
um, including through data visualizations, you introduce risk to those communities, especially if they are at risk communities, um, which gets kind of redundant. So um, be aware of the line between data collection and surveillance. So do you have informed consent from the community that you are trying to learn more about? and visualize, you know, to advertise or reach through visualization. So do you have informed consent from that community to collect information about them? Is that information meaningful? Um, I, in my experience, research groups and researchers tend to just collect data to have it because it is very difficult to go through the research. Uh, uh, so like the IRB process, the inter institutional review board process, um, you have to get permission to do certain data collection activities, especially if your data involves people um, in human research. So they tend to just collect stuff to have it, um, but it's not always usable and it's not always meaningful. So one example of that is the gender field, which I plug on a lot. Um, so if you are trying to get a better feel for your community, um, a lot of times the standard question is, you know, what gender are you in a survey? So if you're filling out a survey, say you're doing like a medical, uh, medical study, so you're going in and doing some sort of health study, they'll ask you what gender you are, male or female is the usual answer, um, and then they'll ask you all of the other health questions. Um, a lot of the times these studies don't uh, involve gender at all, they just collect that because it's a standard question, um, but that can affect how people respond to the survey later on. So some folks, especially trans folks um, or non-binary folks of different gender diverse identities won't respond to that survey in the way that other people do. Um, and it can skew results a lot too. So if you're um, doing especially medical studies on um, hormones or things like that, it can affect the results that a researcher gets. Um, in terms of library programming, it could have the effect of making people feel less welcomed. So if you report data about your community and only use male or female, you leave out a lot of other gender identities and those people are less likely to think of the library as an ally um, and less likely to feel welcome. Um, so that's just one example of that. Uh, uh, if you're reporting data, make sure it makes sense for what you're actually trying to say. Um, that kind of also goes in with, is the data being accurately represented? Um, so once again, that quantitative numerical data is often thought of as cold and unbiased and hard fact, but it's often not. Um, data represents real people and it is collected by real people. So it carries with it that bias. Um, when you're collecting data, um, when you are representing it and designing it with different colors and, and icons or iconography, the creator of that data visualization puts in their own views and their own opinions through that too. Um, so it can affect how it's being represented. And finally, um, another thing to keep in mind is data visualization is an extension of other data activities. And I kind of hinted at that a couple seconds ago when I mentioned data collection um, and an analysis. So what do I mean by that or by extension? So say you know from experience that your library has a large population of young adults in its surface area. So all of those young adults go out of their way to the next library over. So say they go to Alamance County for some reason um, or a different uh, library within Guilford County um, because it has more young adult collections. It has more things for them to read that they're looking for. You know that the library is looking to cut services or collections, even though they have a lot of young adult collections, they want to cut some of it. Um, you want those individuals that are going out of their way to go to that library to come to your library so they don't have to travel as far. Um, so you want to prove this with data. You want to summarize your findings in a visualization. You'll share it with your um, director, your library head, and you'll put it into a grant proposal or share it at a board meeting or, you know, something to propose funding um, or programming. So before you even create your data visualization, you have to do a bunch of other um, activities. So if you're using other data, you have to discover it. Um, if you are collecting data about the community, you have to collect it. And that goes through a bunch of different pro uh, processes where um, you want to make sure you're managing that data correctly using the, the right survey questions. Um, and then once you have that data, you have to store it properly. Um, you then analyze that data, get some meaning out of it, do statistics, and then you can create your data visualization. And once you have that data visualization, you have to think about sharing and publishing it. So there's a bunch of different steps um, where ethics will come into play and where ethical questions should be asked. Um, most, or sorry, real quick, 
most if not all of those steps will be addressed by the IRB Institutional Review Board process, um, but especially for libraries or um, non-academic institutions, they don't have that process necessarily. Um, so while we are lucky in that if we're doing human subjects research, we probably already know what questions to ask. Some folks don't. And I saw a question, I think, or a chat, but I, whoops, oh yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so here are some ethical questions to ask, um, especially if you haven't been through the IRB process, but you still want to use data visualization that's about um, a community of people. So the first question is, who is your community? Um, does it include protected or at-risk groups, especially LGBTQIA folks? Does it include um, Black, Indigenous, people of color? Um, does it include uh, children, prisoners, um, other protected groups, et cetera? Um, so who are they? Um, Second is, is the data about this community considered public knowledge or information? Um, and or is there an expectation of confidentiality? Um, so with recording people on the street, for example, um, if they're on the street, if they're out in public, I think there is an expectation of confidentiality. Um, but you still might want to blur their faces depending on what is going on and where they are. Um, so with recent Black Lives Matter protests, when you're sharing videos of, of protesters, a lot of folks are, are encouraging people to blur faces of protesters, um, given prior history and precedent um, with uh, fallback or um, negative things happening to protesters. You know, you can identify people in their faces, see where they are, um, and they don't want that information out there versus if it's things like information that's captured on the census. Um, all of that data is anonymous or anonymized and it's um, not tied to one specific person. So that data would be considered public knowledge or public information. Anybody can see it. It's not about a specific person. Your data visualizations based on that data are likely appropriate to share. Um, all right. The third one is, does your community or subject know about the data collection? So like when you're you know, being recorded at a protest, do they know that they're being recorded? Do they have, uh, I guess, awareness, um, basically informed consent to be captured by this data collection? Um, after that is, do they consent to collection and give permission for sharing? So if they know about it, do they consent to that data being used in a data visualization? Um, especially if it's things like who is, um, so one of the things that we don't do, you know, is collect what books people checked out or what topics they checked out. And we don't share that, you know, undergrads love to check out books about a specific subject, um, or I guess a specific undergrad losing that train of thought. Okay, um, so we can also think about how will the data be used um, and how could the data be used. So if the data were to somehow get off of your server or the place where you have stored it, um, can it be used to target or negatively impact the community you're trying to reach out to? Um, and that goes into risks. So what are the risks and what is the risk level, um, especially if your community is one of those at-risk groups? Um, how could that information possibly be used against them? Um, so this goes in with geographic information a lot. There's a lot of risk associated with geographic information when you zoom in to a certain um, level. So uh, the United States Census reports their demographic data um, in an anonymized way. And one of the ways that they help make this anonymous is by reporting it for a broad geographic region. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so you've got your state within the nation, you've got your county within the state, you've got a smaller tract within this county, and then you've got block groups. And that's as small as the census will report data. So you can't really identify individual residences or individual people in this geographic location versus if you go any smaller than that to a block group or a neighborhood or a specific house or apartment complex, it gets a lot easier to see information about specific people and maybe connect that information to that person. Um, so if you have data um, and you know that there is a redhead in a neighborhood that 
goes to the store and buys like six eggs or something. Um, they buy a specific product. And you also know in another data set that that red has an, redheaded person's name is Carl, that they're a school teacher and they live at you know this address. Um, you can combine those two data sets and you can learn too much about that person than is necessary for your purposes. Um, so um, in this example um, from Tectonics Geo was earlier on in the COVID-19 process. So we've heard a lot about um, contact tracing, um, potentially tracking locations of people and where they've been. Um, and we see they have seen this previously as well with, um, it's called geofencing, is when a, uh, I guess, investigator, uh, police investigator can serve a warrant to Google, I think Google Maps, and they can get information about where, what folks, what people have been in a specific area at a specific time um, to see if they were around during when a crime was committed. Um, and there are a lot of problems with that in terms of, you know, just because someone had their phone in that area doesn't mean they're related to that crime, but the police are able to get that information and possibly connect you to it. Um, so in this example, which I'll play because I think I have a little bit of time. And I think, can you all see the tweet that's up on the screen? I'll play it without sound. Oops, I'll try to play it without sound. So they wanted to see how foot traffic can be used to see, um, specifically they were looking at spring break in Florida, in Fort Lauderdale, and they wanted to see if they could tell where the people that were on, the, on this specific beach that they're zooming in on, um, where they went after their spring break celebration um, to see, you know, where did they go? Who did they maybe come into contact with? Could they have spread COVID-19 throughout all these other cities? So they tracked this one specific beach, um, which had a couple hundred people on it. And they were able to, using this foot traffic database, um, track where they went after that. And I believe they did a couple, a week or two, or a couple days. So the brighter yellow orange is where those people that were on that beach went after spring break was over. So you can see like they went all up and down the Northeast coast, um, et cetera. So in this example, this data set um, claims and says that they um, anonymized their data set. Oops. They anonymized their data set so that um, those hundred couple, a couple of hundred people can't be identified, but depending on how far you zoom in and whether you have, you know, things like IP addresses attached to those phones, um, which is they use the mobile devices to track the, the foot traffic, you know, can you eventually identify those people, especially if they're in the same neighborhood, if they're going around the same area, can you track them down to their house level? Um, so you see that a lot in geography, um, in GIS data sets not as relevant for things like library, but it's still something to keep in mind in terms of privacy. We want to keep our patrons um, locations and what they're checking out, what they're doing in the library private, and that should be reflected in the data you collect and the data you're sharing in visualizations. The final question, um, which I'll leave y'all with, is does the benefit to the community outweigh the risk? Um, especially when we are sharing things like outreach for programming, the goal is to get people aware of free programming or programming to help them in their lives um, and their you know, information literacy and things like that. Um, but if it introduces risk to that same community, it might not be a great use of that data and of data visualization. All right. So I think that is all I have. If anybody has questions. Thank you so much, Joe. This was great. This was awesome. Um, if people have questions, please feel free to put those questions in the chat right now. Um, in case anyone's leaving before the end of the hour, I am going to put our little assessment form link in there. Um, I feel I, I've one of the things that was really interesting and I talked about this in the chat is that I had seen that um, Florida gun law thing 
a couple years ago because a student of mine submitted it um, as a, a bad visualizations assignment. Um, and the first time I looked at it, I was just like, what, what's wrong with this? And then I looked at it closer and I was like, oh, I, you know, because we're like not used to seeing a, an axis that's sort of opposite of what we would have expected it to be. Um, but I had never thought about whether or not the person, I just kind of assumed that the person who made it did it on purpose, but I never really thought right. about that. So this thought made me think about that. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Does anybody yeah, no, else I, have I, questions? I, 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 Seeing some say, lovely comments. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we keep talking over each other. Hilarious. I remember being very mad when I first saw that graphic like earlier last year because I was like, oh, like the police department is trying to misrepresent data. And then I actually investigate it further. And I feel really bad for the visualization creator because she was not trying to do that at all. <laughs> so. Um, Joe, have you ever seen the, I think it's a Tumblr, um, WTF.viz? I have not. Oh, it's got some pretty good stuff on it. But now I'm wondering, like, most of it is stuff I see as humorous, but now your presentation is making me wonder if, like, yeah. Oh, there we go. Oh, cool. Deborah Twinsies. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is one that has always... Like it's got some really good, um, like bad pie charts um, and things like that. But uh, it's just, it's, it has always helped me. Um, yes, there we go. We have seen, I just put one in, Deborah put one in too. Um, the one I put in is about emojis. Oh no. Um, and it's, it's a terrible pie chart. It's really bad. Oh, wow. The mortality rate phase portrait diagram. Oh, goodness. Yeah, the de visualizations like that, especially ones that tend to be shared on like, you know, bad visualization ones, a lot of them are unintentional. Um, or when you're creating your data visualization, a lot of times since you're creating it, you understand it, and then you forget how difficult it is to understand it unless you're familiar with how it was created so like that was one of the the goals of my visualizing the future group is it's not enough to just know how to create a chart you have to think about why um and really make design choices and and really and critically think about what you're doing when you're making a data viz because there's too many out there that are just like oh no <laughs> do you think that it's a is it a good practice after you make a visualization to like ask someone who wasn't involved in the data collection to look at it. Okay. Yes, That's 100%. Yeah, that and, and vetting it or sharing it with other people within the same department that maybe know the data that you're working with um, before you share it out on things like Twitter or Facebook or in a report, even if it's like only gonna be internally shared. Um, so if it's gonna be put into a report or white paper or you know shared with anybody to help prove a point like yeah really spread it around as much as you can with your colleagues before um, publishing it yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah oh that's a good point that deborah and uh, charlie mentioned that it might be satire too like so there i have seen some data visualizations and especially data comics that are uh, satire, but they don't have any other indication that they are. So some people take them at face value when they're removed from the context and like republished on like, you know, Google images or on Facebook without the original caption. Um, so that's, yeah. Yeah, Deborah mentioned in the chat, I'm just seeing this for the recording that with phone tracking in Korea, people were able to track down COVID spreaders from data viz and other data release and harass them, even though it was ostensibly anonymous. Mm -hmm. I had also wondered about this with that whole Lake of the Ozarks party thing um, yeah. that happened, uh, was it Memorial Day maybe? Um, at some point recently, because they started, you know, post like basically putting out a schedule, like the person who has COVID went to <laughs> so-and-so at this time and then later went to a pool party here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Deborah says, this is more a data privacy than Viz thing, but phone data is definitely being used to track protesters and arrest them after the protests are over. I am, I am sure that that unfortunate thing is happening. Yeah. And it's, and it's all related. Yeah. So 
that's um, also why I mentioned that data viz is an extension of data. So just anything that could be a, a facet of just data in general. So like a data privacy thing could eventually be a data viz thing if it's represented in a data visualization. Um, it's all related. Yeah, cool. great. I'm going to put the uh, assessment form link in there. Oh, nope. Actually, I accidentally just put one of those WTF.viz links in there, not the assessment form. Um, in here one last time. And then I'm going to once again thank Joe so much for doing this presentation for us and to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, I know I'm about to head to that info session on COVID 19 or whatever they're calling it. Um, so if anybody else is going, I will see you over there. Um, but one last time, thanks so much to Joe. I'm going to stop the recording before I forget. Um, not that anything like happens. It doesn't just keep recording forever. But.